Jay Billis will be working the uh, college draft, the NBA draft, coming up uh, tomorrow night. Also wanted to talk to him about the possibility of bubbleizing the entire NCAA tournament in Indianapolis. And Jay joins us now. Jay, let me start with the draft coming up here. Is there that true franchise, you know, driven player, talent-wise, that you can go, we can lock in on that guy and we can build around? Probably not. Uh, there are a couple players that that I think may fit that description. One is Anthony Edwards of Georgia, although he's not yet a finished product. Uh, his decision-making and defense need to improve. But the other is James Wiseman of Memphis, who only played three games this year before he got in that you know sort of NCAA issue and then wound up saying, I, I've just had enough of this. He, he was supposed to sit out like 12 games after playing the first three. He's like, I'm not doing this anymore and just walked. So we didn't get a chance to see him, but he's still Chris. You know, he's got Chris Bosh type ability, except he's bigger, seven one and seven six wingspan, all that stuff. Um, but they're outside of that, Dan. There are a bunch of really good players and guys that'll be starters in the league and maybe better. But there's no, there aren't any no brainer picks like we've had in past drafts. Have you fallen in love with somebody? I mean, there are a bunch of guys I really like. Um, like I really like Tyrese Halliburton of Iowa State. I really like Isaac Okoro of uh, of Auburn. Um, you know, guys like that. Uh, Onyeka Kangwu of USC, I like a lot. But there, there's nobody like you were asking, I think, initially. You know, is there anybody? There, there's nobody like LeBron or Kyrie or something. Where do you go? Okay, he's the number one pick for sure. Will be an all star, that kind of thing. Um, but there will be players that come out. I'm, I'm positive there'll be players that come out of this draft um, that'll be like Draymond Green or, um, uh, you know, you, you name it. I mean, a bunch of players that have been taken further down in the draft that have turned out to be great, whether it's Clay Thompson. Uh, yeah, there are a whole bunch we could we could go down and name. The 15th pick that we were probably saying at the time, well, you know, could be a starter and maybe better, but we weren't we weren't sure. The reaction to LaMelo Ball, if he's not LaMelo Ball and he's just another name, do we have a different reaction to him this high in the draft? Uh, maybe. I mean, I know he drags in some of the stuff with his dad a little bit, uh, you know, a little bit of baggage there for some people. But my thing with him, Dan, is is he's ultra talented uh, as a, a ball handler, passer. Um, you know, he's got positional size and length and all that. But he doesn't guard anybody and he doesn't shoot it. And those are kind of big deals. And he hasn't finished a season in a long time either. So he's not had a normal sort of existence for a player that does. That's not a bad thing. It's just it's just a data point. Um, but he's one of those guys that you're going, hey, could be could be really good. And then but could be less than that. Um, like, I don't think he's going to you know get into the league and not not be a good player. But but I think if you're going to go one, two or three, you have some pretty high expectations how do the ball boys not be able to shoot yeah that's a good question I mean you know I know you're you've always been a great shooter and um but you know there are there are guys that can't can't shoot and and you know Lonzo's guy it, my thing has been why can't somebody fix their mechanics to the point where um you know like if the shot's not going in then I think you got to you got to fix the mechanics. Like Reggie Miller is a, a, like an, an example of you know you you wouldn't have you wouldn't have taught Reggie to shoot that way. You know with his elbow out and all that stuff. It's not classic form. Damn thing went in every time. <laughs> so you're not gonna, or, or Jamal Wilkes. Like nobody would have told Jamal Wilkes like you need to wrap it around your head before you shoot it. But it went in every time. So you're not messing with that. Um, but if it doesn't go in, I think you have to mess with it. And for those guys, ball doesn't go in enough. And actually, Lonzo was a better shooter than Lamelo. Uh, Lamelo's got a lower release and it doesn't go in near the rate that Lonzo's went in. But you got Leangelo, the other ball brother, who all he does is shoot. He has a great shot. He has, you know, great range there. I just, it's just kind of baffling that, you know, the dad who was there when Naismith, uh, you know, put up the basket, the peach basket – didn't teach his kids how to shoot, you know, just a normal jump shot here. I'm amazed. Yeah, it's not just on him. I think it's on the game. I don't know. Like, it's almost like uh, 
uh, it's almost like shooting uh, was like the golf swing used to be years ago where you didn't mess with it, you know, that, that it was something that you, you left alone and uh, just more repetition and, and I'll, I'll get better. But I, I do think there's a mechanics thing to it. Um, but especially if it doesn't go in, I mean, the best shooting coach I've ever been around is Chip England, who happened to be a teammate of mine at Duke my, my freshman year. He was a senior and uh, just got a great way about him of teaching, teaching shooting. Uh, but there aren't a lot of guys that feel comfortable out there teaching it. And that, that's unfortunate, especially the lower levels. Minnesota's got the number one. Does Minnesota keep the number one pick? I don't know. I mean, there's going to be, it seems like there's going to be more trade activity in this draft, but you know, you've been through this drill more than me. You know, you always hear about how many trades there are going to be. And then there, there aren't a ton on draft day and other, other years you don't hear as much and there are a bunch of trades. So, uh, you know, look, unless you're in love with somebody, it makes sense to trade back, but it, it's, it's only if you can get who you want. And then what are you going to get in exchange for the pick? My sense is in this year's draft, if you've got the number one pick, you, you, you use it. Um, and if, uh, like, you know, I don't know if they, if, if the, uh, Timberwolves like, um, Anthony Edwards or James Wiseman or LaMelo Ball, whatever it is, but it seems like they, there's a consensus that those are the top three picks what order they go in, we'll see. But but I think I think uh, Edwards is the best overall prospect with his skill level, uh, his body, his athleticism. Uh, he has the chance to be the best player. Doesn't mean he will be, but he has the chance to be. Yeah, I saw an interview with him yesterday on ESPN, and I I really just he sounded mature. He sounded like he was ready for this this big move. We're talking to Jay Billis, ESPN college basketball analyst. What did you make of the possibility of bubbleizing? March Madness in Indianapolis. Smart move. Uh, I think it's the only way in the current climate that we're facing that we're going to get an NCAA tournament in. You know, you you have if you're going to try to get a tournament in 13 different venues from the the first four to the first round to the Elite Eight to the Final Four in Indianapolis, it's not going to work. And I think Danny Gavitt and uh, the the tournament committee realized that, and they decided to to make the adjustment now so they didn't have to make it later. Uh, and it's a smart move. And, and look, I, I think a lot of people might feel like I would jump all over this and say, see, they're pros. Um, that, this is not the time for that. They're pros anyway. So this, it doesn't matter whether they play in bubbles or not, but you, you'll remember at the beginning of the pandemic, when we were talking about all this stuff that, that you had a lot of administrators saying, Hey, no students on campus, no college sports. Well, they backed off that in a hurry. Yeah. And, and then they were saying, well, we, we can't have bubbles. These are amateurs. They backed off that in a hurry. We're going to start the season in a bubble at the Mohegan Sun. We're going to end it in as close to a bubble as you can get in Indianapolis with the, at least I think it'll be in Indianapolis. That's the, the initial indication for the NCAA tournament. It's just smart business. Like the, basketball needs to have a season this year. Um, the, it's really kind of an existential issue for the NCAA. That's the only revenue they have is the NCAA tournament. If there's not a tournament, the NCAA is in trouble uh, after this season. Uh, if we have a tournament, I think we get through this and everything's fine. If we don't, uh, two years of no revenue and and th- there's a, a, a real existential problem. So I'm glad they're doing it this way and I'm glad we're moving toward it. And oddly enough, Dan, Right now, the students going home on almost every campus across the country going home like this week, next week, whatever it is for Thanksgiving, and they're not coming back. That's the best chance we have to get a basketball season in because the teams are going to be essentially isolated and quarantined on their own campus with no other students. And that's the best chance we have. Yeah, I wondered if the Pac-12 would have waited till Thanksgiving to start their football season with everybody gone and then you try to do it like that or the Big Ten. You know, you want to be in the final four. You want to go to a bowl game, but you do want to get the season in. Pac-12, probably not going to get their season in. The Big Ten stumbled a little bit here, but I do agree with you. Once the students go home, you're basically bubbleizing your basketball team as well. Let me go back to what you said about the NCAA. If they don't have March Madness over a two-year period, what do you think happens to the NCAA? Well, it's going to be, I think there will be a lot of change. I mean, you don't have money. It's going to be hard to operate on the same level and hard to, hard to keep employees and all that other stuff. And I think they just lose their grip uh, and college basketball gets diminished. I don't think there's any question about that. Um, now, is it going to go, it's not going to go away, 
But without the revenue, I mean, there, there are going to be so many things, so many dominoes that fall in a negative direction. Uh, I think it gets diminished. And, and look, I think it's going to be diminished going forward a little bit anyway. Uh, but, but I think it's, I think there's going to be a, a loosening of the grip on, uh, on college sports and the conferences start taking over and we see some changes that we wouldn't have anticipated otherwise. Yeah. I still think that the power five, uh, is just going to grab college football. They own the, they own college football. NCAA doesn't. And you just secede from the union. I don't know if you see the power five conferences in college basketball doing the same. We do love the underdog. We embrace the underdog. The underdog gets a chance in college football. The underdog does not. Yeah, I, I think there's still a reluctance to go away from the current NCAA tournament model. That's a big part of keeping everything together. And look, there are a lot of the old timers like us, frankly, um, but but guys we know from back in the day that when in 1984, when there was the the uh, Supreme Court case, uh, you know, o- Oklahoma Board of Regents case uh, that took basically took football away from the NCAA. The NCAA used to tell, in their their infinite wisdom, used to tell schools how often they could be on television because they thought that they were protecting the gate, like the number of spectators that would come to a game. They thought that's where all the money was. They didn't realize (laughs) that the money's in television. Uh, So, you know, that's when the CFA started, the College Football Association, started negotiating uh, TV contracts and all that. There were a lot of people that thought it would have been better if if they took football and basketball away from the NCAA and we wouldn't have all the the ridiculous issues that we have now. Um, I don't know that I agree with that, but um, but there's a real reluctance to take basketball to take the tournament and mess with it because of what you mentioned, sort of the, um, you know, the Cinderella aspect of it. I think if they took the tournament, the power five just took the tournament and started their own tournament. Right? They just started their own tournament. They could invite whoever they wanted. But we're going to get to a point where the Power Five's only going to play each other. They're only going to play each other in football. And, and someday, they're only going to play each other in basketball because the fans have spoken. They don't want to watch the, these early season, you know, home game versus directional school stuff. They don't go to the games. They don't watch them on TV like they used to. They're not consuming them the same way. They want to watch big shots against big shots, and then we'll leave the Cinderella stuff for the tournament at the end. Would you want Mark Emmert's job as the head of the NCAA? I get asked that a lot because I'm so critical of the NCAA at times. Um, not all the time. I, I, when they do a good job, I say so. Um, but And I, I joke about it, but I, I've served on NCAA committees in the past, both when I was in college and now. I've always said that I'll help. If there's ever a chance I can really help, I'll do it. But the one thing I know is because of my views on amateurism, I don't have to worry about ever being asked to do anything <laughs> by the NCAA. Um, like even, even the stuff they're doing now with name, image, and likeness, like they're such ridiculous baby steps. You're going, come on, man, Let, let's just do this. Uh, I mean, why are we taking baby steps on this stuff? It's over. You know, you, you, you have admitted that they're pros by just bro- broaching the subject of name, image, and likeness. Let's go and get it over with. And they, they won't pull the Band-Aid off and just do it. Were you a student athlete at Duke or an athletic student at Duke? I was, I was neither. Like, I look at it, um, here's what, the way I look at it. When I was playing, I was a, a player. And when I was in class, I was a student. And I don't, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. We don't, we don't ask anybody else what their priorities are. You know, there's no other student that you go, okay, now is academics your first priority or are you here for being a musician or are you spending more time in the Greek system or like, what are your priorities? You know, it's kind of like saying, are, are you a broadcaster husband and father? Or are you a husband and father broadcaster? Like what, what's more important to you, Dan? Like it, 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 the, these are questions that we only ask of athletes. I'm a broadcaster only, first, Jay. What's that? I'm a broadcaster first. Yeah, yeah, a, a nominated broadcaster. Too. Yes, not don't win, but we get nominated. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry Seinfeld had a great, um, great quote about that. And comedians uh, in cars getting coffee, he said, uh, like apparently Seinfeld, the number one show, uh, didn't win any Emmys as a show, or maybe only won one over that run that they had. And his thing was, who cares? He goes, he goes, the job is the award. And I was like, that's pretty damn cool. I should have thought of that. The job is the award. No, it's not. No, the yeah, job is the, the job. Is the, the award is the award. 
but but you know I, you have to give yourself some credit and i give myself a lot of credit for <laughs> acting like when somebody else wins and we're clapping acting like we're legitimately happy for the winner there is an art to that jay because every year when bob costas would win i had to act like um I'm a little surprised, but not that surprised. You know, you go, oh, oh, yeah. And then you know that somebody's watching you. And then I used to start clapping when they were opening the the envelope. Like, I just wanted to get ahead of this, that, hey, that Dan Patrick's team. Yeah, Bob Cost is one another damn whatever sports jamming. Yeah, it's it's an art. It's an art. It's acting is what that is, Jay. It is acting. That is, acting. is acting. Thanks. And, and that should be an award too. The the best <laughs> performance by a loser. And the winner is once again Dan Patrick. Um, <laughs> have fun tomorrow night, there, Jay. Great to talk to you as always. Thank you for your insights. It's never as much fun without you there. Oh, uh, I know. Oh, I know. But I'm not coming back to the mothership, Jay. Well, I could come to you. Oh, whoa. Uh, let me see. Who do I get? I'd have to get rid of this would be like a James Harden situation. I'd have to get rid of probably three Danettes. Oh, I'm worth more than three Danettes. I <laughs> <promise> you <that. laughs> Thank you, Jay. Good luck tomorrow night. Thank you. That's Jay Billis, ESPN College basketball analyst.